Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Ariz Shafkat. I'm a fourth year medical student. And today the lecture is going to be on transcription. We'll cover two lectures today. The first one is quite basic. The second one is a bit more difficult, but uh, Dr. Al Jada likes to ask sort of very specific questions. And so we'll just focus on, you know, the important things you need to know. I've made my own lecture and sort of summarized both the PowerPoints. And so if you want the PowerPoints after the lecture, I can give you them. And sometimes I might sort of forget to read the chat. So just, you know, if you have a question, just unmute and, you know, you can interrupt me whenever you like. Okay. So before we begin this lecture, I would like to focus on, you should have already done this, but I would like to focus on the central dogma of molecular biology. And basically what you have is you have DNA in the nucleus. That DNA gets transcribed into messenger RNA. And that RNA then gets moved out into the cytoplasm, gets bound by an organelle called a ribosome, and then it gets translated into a protein. All the proteins you have in your body, for instance, um, when you eat a high carbohydrate meal, your body likes to release insulin. Now insulin um, is a protein, so it requires, so there's a gene for insulin. And when you eat a high carbohydrate meal, RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme, goes into the um, nucleus and it binds to the promoter of the gene for insulin. Then it, then it produces mRNA, which encodes insulin. That mRNA goes out into the cytoplasm and then it gets translated into insulin. And so these processes are very, very important if you want to understand molecular biology. And transcription and translation, this whole process is collectively called gene expression. Okay. So I've just summarized that for you, genetic information is stored in the base sequence of DNA. As you know, adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine, these make up DNA. DNA is transcribed into pre-mRNA by RNA polymerase. In bacteria, which are prokaryotes, is transcribed directly into mRNA. Pre-mRNA is then processed into mature mRNA. mRNA goes out into the cytoplasm and gets translated into a protein. This lecture was focus specifically on transcription. This is just a review. You guys should know this already. As you know, DNA is a double-stranded molecule arranged into a double helix. Here's the five prime end of DNA with a phosphate group attached to the five carbon. And at the end, you have the three prime end, the hydroxyl end. The other strand is anti-parallel. So it's the opposite. It's three prime up and then five prime below. Okay. Why I'm telling you this again is because you have to know and Dr. Al Jada likes to ask that I've seen this in a, quite a few exams, that you should know that RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that mediates transcription, it reads DNA from the five prime end to the three prime end. So it'll either go, it, it will go this way, all right? Three prime end to five prime end or this way. So mRNA, because it's anti-parallel, is synthesized five prime to three prime. However, the, by convention, when you write a base sequence, so in a question, when they write a base sequence for you, they'll write, for example, G, U, G, T, A, C, G, for instance. You have to know that that uh, sequence is written from five prime to three prime. For example, they can ask you that the template strand for DNA, which is going to be transcribed, its sequence is A, T, G, C, A. You have to reverse that because they've given you that sequence from five prime to three prime. You have to reverse that from three prime to five prime and then match with the options uh, what the mRNA transcript is going to be. Does it, this make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, I think there's a sample question later on in the presentation as well. We can look through that. So uh, DNA is made as uh, composed of two strands, the template strand, which is the strand you make mRNA from, which is the strand that RNA polymerase binds to, is called the template or the anti-sense strand. Again, it goes from three prime to five prime. Non, the non-transcribed strand is called the coding strand or the sense strand. Okay. As you can see here, this is just a summary of what we discussed on the last slide. This is the five prime end to the three prime end. This is the three prime end to the five prime end. Notice how transcription is occurring from three prime to five prime. So it's going from here to here, here to here. 
on this trend is going from here to here, which is the reverse, because this is three prime to five prime. Now you should know that the, this green here is where, the, where RNA polymerase binds. So RNA polymerase has to recognize the gene. For instance, I gave you the example of insulin. RNA polymerase to transcribe the gene for insulin has to bind to a region of the gene called a promoter. And this promoter is upstream of the gene and RNA polymerase binds to this and then transcribes the gene. So the promoter is the RNA polymerase binding site. Why I'm telling you this is because in eukaryotes or in humans, RNA polymerase sort of, um, let me give you an example. So our, let's say you eat a high carbohydrate meal and RNA polymerase goes into the nucleus to find the gene for insulin, but there's 20,000 genes for 20,000 genes with 20,000 promoters. How is RNA polymerase going to know that this is the specific gene I'm supposed to bind to? It's because on this promoter, there will be other proteins called transcription factors, specifically called general transcription factors. So these general transcription factors, they sit on the promoter and they basically tell RNA polymerase that this is the promoter that uh, you should bind to, okay? RNA polymerase. It's a protein that it recognizes the gene and then transcribes it into mRNA. Oh, you, can't, you guys can't hear me? We can hear you. It's just a little bit, like, not that loud, basically. Okay. Um, hmm. Let me remove it's the... Okay, if you can, it's doable. It's not bad. Right. If we increase our device volumes, everyone will hear you clearly. Okay, let me remove the headphone and see how it sounds, okay? What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Clearly? Okay. All right. Okay, so first we let me just summarize what I've said so far. The central dogma of molecular biology is called gene expression. Gene expression involves DNA, which is in the nucleus, to get transcribed into RNA, specifically mRNA. That mRNA moves out into the cytoplasm to get translated into a protein. This step is mediated by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Replication, DNA replication was mediated by an enzyme called DNA polymerase, okay? Then I told you that DNA is, has double strands. It's two strands arranged in a double helix. One strand goes from the five prime end to the three prime end. One strand goes from the three prime end to the five prime end. It's important for you to know that RNA polymerase reads DNA from three prime to five prime. However, the way of writing a base sequence sort of in a question is always from five prime to three prime. So they could ask you in the exam and they probably will in the midterm, they will give you a sequence of DNA and they'll tell you what will the mRNA sequence be. So for instance, they will give you a sequence called, um, let me sort of show you an example. Um, okay. So here is a DNA strand. This is from five prime to three prime, and this from three prime to five prime, okay? You have to know that RNA polymerase will either proceed in this direction or in this direction. Like for this strand, it will proceed in this direction. For the, up strand, for the strand above, it will proceed from three prime to five prime. Let's say this is the sequence which is going to get transcribed, okay? And this sequence will be A, T, G, C, and G. But this is written from five prime to three prime because that's the convention of writing. So you have to reverse it. You have to say G, C, G, T, and A. And now you can sort of match the mRNA sequence. So this will be, um, this will be C, G, C, A, and U. Okay? Does everyone understand this concept? All right. Is there an instance where we shouldn't reverse it? Um, if this if they specifically tell you that this D, this sequence that they've given you is from three prime to five prime, then you shouldn't reverse it. Otherwise, you should always reverse it because by convention, um, okay, 
So because by convention, the way of writing a base sequence is from five prime to three prime. So whenever you get a question, always assume that they've list that, that they've written the base sequence from five prime to three prime. And mRNA is transcribed three prime to five prime. So you have to reverse the sequence they've given you and then match the base pairs. Okay. Anyway, let's go back to what we were discussing. All right. Now, again, this is the same concept. Um, specifically for this slide, what you need to know is that for RNA polymerase to bind to transcribe a gene, it has to bind to a region called the promoter. A promoter is upstream from the gene and it serves as the RNA polymerase binding site. Okay. Um, there's a question in the chat. We only reverse it only in transcription, not for replication. Um, replication, it depends on the strand you're talking about. So um, they could just give you a strand and they could ask you to match the base pairs. You don't need to do that. Um, for more details on it, you should look at your replication lecture. Okay. Because I'm not really sure, for instance, if Dr. Al Jada will sort of trick you like that. The questions I've personally seen him give, he's always talked about transcription. Okay. Um, so the R, so RNA polymerase binds to a promoter, but there's an issue that you have about 20,000 genes in your nucleus and each of those genes has a promoter. So how does RNA polymerase know which gene or which promoter it's supposed to bind to? And that problem is solved by things called transcription factors, but general transcription factors. General transcription factors sit on this promoter and basically tell RNA polymerase that you should bind to this promoter here, okay? And, and this will allow RNA polymerase to bind to the correct gene, basically. There's another type of region called an enhancer. Enhancers are found, um, can you go slower? Okay. So the concept I was basically explaining here is that to cause, to allow transcription to happen, you have to have RNA polymerase binding to the DNA. RNA polymerase binds to the DNA by binding to a promoter. A promoter is a region upstream from DNA, up, upstream from the gene. But the problem is there are many promoters in the nucleus in your chromosomes. So how does RNA polymerase know which promoter it's supposed to bind to? Basically, what happens is there are proteins called general transcription factors, which bind to this promoter. That will tell RNA polymerase that this is the promoter RNA polymerase is supposed to bind to. Okay. And that allows RNA polymerase to sort of transcribe the correct gene, okay? Then there are regions of DNA called enhancers, and these are located far from the gene. So promoters are located next to the gene, and enhancer might be located very far from the gene. These regions called enhancers are bound by things called specific transcription factors, and these increase transcription. So general transcription factors increase transcription and gene expression by a little amount, Specific transcription factors increase gene expression by a lot. You will learn this more when you discuss regulation of gene expression. Okay. Now, we're discussing transcription, so we're only talking about mRNA. However, mRNA is not the only type of RNA you have in the cell. There's an RNA called ribosomal RNA. So ribosomes are organelles in the cytoplasm, and they're made up of RNA and proteins. That RNA that they have is called ribosomal RNA, okay? Do all promoters have general transcription factors or just the initial one? All promoters have general transcription factors, okay? And that's associated with the low amount of gene expression. If you, for instance, if you eat a high carbohydrate meal and you wanna upregulate the insulin gene expression by a lot, you have to have specific transcription factors binding to enhancers, okay? General transcription factors are associated with a low level of transcription or gene expression. So mRNA is not the only type of RNA in the cell. There's ribosomal RNA, which is found in ribosomes, transfer RNA or tRNA. Basically what happens is when mRNA goes out into the cytoplasm to get translated, tRNA carries amino acids to the ribosome mRNA complex. And this allows the ribosome to add those amino acids for protein synthesis. So the function of tRNA is carrying amino acids to the ribosome during translation. 
Then there's an RNA called heterogeneous nuclear RNA or HNRNA or pre-mRNA. These three are the same thing. This is only found in eukaryotic cells because in eukaryotes, when you transcribe DNA, you make pre-mRNA. Pre-mRNA has to get modified into mature mRNA. So that pre-RNA is called uh, HNRNA as well. Okay, so it might be a point of confusion for you in an exam if they tell you HNRNA, but know that this is just pre-mRNA. And this will get processed by capping, by polyadenylation, by splicing, et cetera. And that mature RNA will then go out into the ribosome. All right. Messenger RNA is just the mature form of HNRNA. When HNRNA is processed, it becomes mRNA, mature mRNA. Small nuclear RNA or snRNA is found in the nucleus and it participates in splicing. So DNA has coding each gene, for instance, the gene of insulin or any other protein has coding regions and non-coding regions. Those non-coding regions are also transcribed. And that pre-mRNA has those introns and exons. So introns are these non-coding regions. Then that mRNA goes through a process called splicing, where those introns are basically removed and those exons are joined back up together. This splicing is, in, is mediated by things called spliceosomes. SNRNA is part of the spliceosome, okay? It participates in the splicing of mRNA, which involves removal of introns. The last type of RNA you should know is ribozyme. Ribozyme is an RNA molecule with enzymatic activity. So for instance, in the ribosome, when you're carrying amino acids for protein synthesis, you also have to link those amino acids together by a peptide bond. So the ribosomal RNA actually contains some enzymatic activity, which allows this peptide bond to be formed. So ribozyme, ribozyme is an RNA molecule with enzymatic activity. An example would be peptidyl transferase RNA in ribosomes, which creates peptide bonds between amino acids during translation. So these are different types of RNA found in the cell, okay? And these different types of RNA in the cell are Sorry. Um, yeah. And these different types of RNA are produced by different RNA polymerases. So we were talking about mRNA during transcription. That mRNA is specifically produced by RNA polymerase 2. Okay. So mRNA is produced by RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 1 synthesizes the 28S, 18S, and 5.5S are, are ribosomal RNA, okay? So this should be five. This is a mistake, by the way. This should be 5S RNA. Um, yeah, so RNA polymerase one synthesizes ribosomal RNA. RNA polymerase two synthesizes mRNA. RNA polymerase three mainly synthesizes tRNA and snRNA and some ribosomal RNA. So know these main ones. Because they could ask you, for instance, um, they could give you a scenario and they could ask you, where is this RNA produced from? Or what enzyme produces this type of RNA? If it's ribosomal RNA, go for RNA polymerase 1. If it's mRNA, go for RNA polymerase 2. If it's tRNA, you should choose RNA polymerase 3. Okay? Um, okay. Sorry, one of these slides basically got switched up a bit, right? So these are different the types of RNA. Recorded? Sorry? Is the meeting recorded? Someone's asking in the chat. Oh, yes, recorded. Thank you. Right. Okay. Now, we've already sort of focused on this, but just to make sure you guys sort of get the terminology down because it does come in exams. So this is the three prime end to the five prime end. Here's the promoter, okay? Here is where RNA polymerase will bind with the help of what? What helps RNA polymerase binding to the promoter? Does anyone know? Transcription factor. General transcription. Yeah, general transcription factors. Specific transcription factors bind to enhancers. Good. So the first, after the promoter, you start transcribing the gene, right? The first base of the gene is designated plus one. Any, G, any base which comes after that 
is called plus two, plus three, plus four. The, the base sequences upstream, so in the promoter, are designated minus one, minus two, minus three. And this is important in basically sort of research because you want to locate, for instance, important mutations in the gene. So let's say they're studying a mutation of which causes a certain disease. For communication purposes, they'll tell that this base or the mutation, the point mutation is specifically at base plus 34. All right. So this way they can identify the exact point where the mutation is happening. All right. So I don't think Sorry, they will ask you much about that. Numbers Sorry? after promoter or in the promoter? If numbers after the promoter. The promoter is sort of, you don't, talk, you don't uh, mention that. The first, because the promoter itself is not transcribed. It's just a place of binding. What is transcribed is the gene. So at the first base pair you transcribe is plus one. Any base pair which, com which comes after that is plus two, plus three, plus four. And within the promoter, basically you go into the minus. So any plus one, then minus one, minus two, minus three, which is the promoter. Does this make sense? Yeah, if you ask me, where is the promoter attaching? I say minus one, minus two, um, right. minus three. Right. The first base pair you transcribe is plus one. All right. Thank you. All right. So who wants to do this question? Who wants to attempt this question? Can I answer? Right. Okay, so basically, it's this is five prime to three prime. Yeah, we flip it, so it's going to be G C U A. So it's G C U A. Yeah. So if anyone couldn't follow, excellent. Um, yeah. So, so this sequence basically we have to match the mRNA sequence, which would uh, result from transcription of this sequence. So this sequence is written from five prime to three prime because I told you that the convention is writing five prime to three prime. So what you do, you have to basically flip it to make C, G, A, and T. And so the mRNA transcript would be, uh, yeah, G, C, U, A, all right, which is E. Does anyone have any problems with this example? The, re the reason why we flipped it, it's because template and template goes from three prime to five prime, right? Yeah, the DNA, no. So the template is what the RNA polymerase strand binds to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I three know. prime to five prime. However, yeah. the way of writing is five prime to three prime. So you always have to flip yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here it says, okay, so like if it doesn't say the DNA sequence, which means we're going to assume it's going to be from five prime to three prime, right? So yeah, you uh, always assume five prime to three prime. But here it says it's template. That's why we flipped it. So it's going to be C, G, A, T, and then we, uh, we, we uh, basically, you know, bind it to RNA yeah. strand to form an RNA exactly. strand. Okay, let me ask you guys if, for instance, let me just say if this was the coding strand, then what would the answer be? Then we won't flip it, and instead of U, we would have T. Exactly. So the coding strand is exactly the same as the mRNA strand. You just have to replace T with U, all right? So if this was the coding strand, you would just say, for instance, U, um, yeah, so U, no, sorry, A, U, C, and G, all right? The coding strand is basically the same as the complementary, right? Yeah, so uh, there's two strands, right? The, the strand that RNA polymerase recognizes is called template or antisense. The other strand, which, which is useless basically, which are, is not useless, but it just doesn't bind RNA polymerase, is called the non-template or the coding strand or the sense strand, all right? Now, so um, the next few slides just focus on some differences between mRNA and DNA. So as you know, mRNA or RNA in general is single-stranded. RNA contains uracil instead of thiamine. All right, RNA, mRNA, pre-mRNA specifically contains introns and exons. And these introns are removed by a process called splicing. Now, the mRNA sequence is composed of many, many base pairs, right? It might be, for instance, U, A, U, G, C, U, A, for instance. Those base, those, that, lo that long base sequence is divided into groups of three. Each group of three it's called a codon because, and each codon encodes a single amino acid. 
Does that make sense? This concept of codons and all right, that's good. Now, this is um, yeah. So now we'll basically focus on what I've told you up until now is based on eukaryotic or human cells. We also have to learn about how bacteria proceed with transcription. And you might think that it's a bit useless, but it's very important because a lot of drugs actually target bacterial gene expression. Because for instance, if a bacteria infects a cell or if there's a bacterial infection in the body, you want to give a drug which is called an antibiotic and what an antibiotic basically does is it either kills the bacteria or it slows down bacterial growth. And how it does this is a lot of drugs basically bind or interfere with bacterial protein synthesis. And so you have to know what specific steps are happening in bacterial protein synthesis versus human gene expression. All right. And this way, pharmacists can develop drugs which specifically target bacterial gene expression without interfering with humans. And so this is why knowing sort of the important regions and the important steps of bacterial protein synthesis is quite useful for you to, in, for instance, in second year, you will discuss drugs like protein synthesis inhibitors. So you should already sort of have an idea of this beforehand. All right, so transcription is, is involves three steps. It involves initiation where RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. This happens in bacteria and in humans or in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, I told you that RNA polymerase is basically helped by transcription factors, which are generally transcription factors. Specific transcription factors bind to enhancers. The prokaryotic RNA polymerase is a bit different. It binds to the promoter with the help of a sigma factor. All right. Plus, this happens in the cytoplasm because prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. All right. So eukaryotic RNA polymerase requires transcription factors to bind to the promoter. Prokaryotic requires sigma factor. The elongation proceeds from three prime to five prime is the same. For the termination, the RNA polymerase basically in humans, it will transcribe the gene and then it will reach a signal called a termination signal. When it reaches that signal, it will basically fall off. In prokaryotes or bacteria, it's a bit different it requires a row factor for termination, all right? So these are some differences you should be aware of. For initiation, it requires sigma factor. For termination, it requires row factor, prokaryotes. For eukaryotes, initiation requires transcription factors. Termination just requires a termination signal. Also, you should know that prokaryotes don't have many different types of RNA polymerases. So for instance, I told you that we have loads of different types of mRNA or RNA and each RNA is produced by a specific type of RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase one synthesizes ribosomal RNA. RNA polymerase two synthesizes mRNA. RNA polymerase three synthesizes tRNA. Prokaryotes don't have that. They just have one RNA polymerase, okay? And its subunit is, is it's composed of subunits called alpha two, beta, beta prime. So that's the subunit or that's the makeup of bacterial RNA polymerase. And let me just give you an example of what I was telling you beforehand. So prokaryotic RNA polymerase is inhibited by rifampin. It's a drug used to treat TB, which is sort of the most common cause of death worldwide. Eukaryotic RNA polymerase 2, which synthesizes mRNA, is inhibited by um, a toxin found in mushrooms called alpha aminitin. So these are some important ones you need to know. I remember this came in our midterm, by the way, that eukaryotic RNA polymerase 2 is inhibited by what? Rifampin or alpha aminitin or some other substances. The answer would be alpha aminitin, okay? Now, again, these are again just some uh, differences between DNA versus RNA. DNA is double-stranded RNA single. RNA, RNA contains uracil instead of thymine. RNA consists... Uh, uh, comprises of ribose instead of deoxyribose in DNA. RNA, mRNA specifically is read by ribosomes. DNA is read by polymerases. DNA polymerase, which causes transcription or, RN, or, or DNA polymerase, which causes replication or, and RNA polymerase, which causes transcription. 
this is DNA is red three prime to five prime. mRNA is red five prime to three prime. So the ribosome translates mRNA from five prime to three prime. Okay. Um, DNA is very long because it's composed of multiple genes and it's arranged into chromosomes. mRNA is only one gene long, but there is an exception to this, which we will get onto. So I'm telling you that mRNA is basically one gene long, but there is an ex exception to this rule, okay? mRNA is composed of base sequences are divided into codons, and each codon encodes a single amino acid. All right, this is again just a summary of prokaryotic versus eukaryotic transcription. I'm emphasizing this because this usually comes in exams, and this is for the first lecture of RNA transcription, this is the most important stuff you should know, all right? So prokaryotic RNA polymerase is one, only one. There's no subtypes. It's composed of subunits called alpha two, beta, beta prime. It requires sigma factor to bind to the promoter. It requires rho factor for termination. It's inhibited by rifampin. Eukaryotes, we have three RNA polymerases. RNA polymerase one synthesizes rRNA, ribosomal RNA, except the 5S. RNA polymerase 2 synthesizes mRNA. RNA polymerase 3 synthesizes tRNA, plus the 5S ribosomal RNA. This, I would say, is minor. Just remember the main ones, okay? We don't require sigma factor to initiate transcription. We require transcription factors. We don't require rho factor for termination. And our RNA polymerase 2 is inhibited by alpha aminitin. all right? Doctor? Yeah, doctor? If you don't mind, can you give us 10 minutes to pray? Then we will come back. Um, sure. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you so much. I think we should also stop the recording here, by the way. Okay. So we stopped at this slide just to recap sort of what we've covered. We've covered this table, which covered differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcription. And this is another table sort of illustrating that, another diagram illustrating that. So in eukaryotic cells, you see we have a nucleus. DNA gets transcribed into mRNA. mRNA contains introns and exons. So these blue regions are exons. These yellow regions are introns, which are basically junk. Introns are non-coding. All right. Introns are basically non-coding. Um, basically, then this mRNA, pre-mRNA, another name for pre-mRNA would be HNRNA. This pre-mRNA gets capped polyadenylated and spliced. Splicing involves removing these yellow bits and basically joining whatever is left. So it joins the exons, gets rid of the introns to form mature mRNA. mRNA goes into the cytoplasm to get translated. In prokaryotes, because that's what we're discussing now, notice that they don't have any introns. And so their mRNA, as soon as it gets transcribed, is already you know, ready for translation. So mRNA in prokaryotes doesn't have a pre-mRNA form. It gets transcribed, and as soon as it gets transcribed, it gets translated. And it's already in the cytoplasm because prokaryotes don't have a cytoplasm. You have a question? Um, what's capping? Uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so we'll discuss that in the next lecture. So this is just sort of a big picture. I'm trying to set up uh, RNA processing. So this uh, yellow and blue bit that you see RNA transcript, this is called pre-mRNA. This can't just go out into the cytoplasm. It has to undergo certain processes for in eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, the mRNA which you transcribe is immediately ready for you know, translation. So that's what I want you to get from this slide. This is again showing, I know it's a bit of a busy picture, but you know, this is basically the gene, this is the promoter. This is the gene in this here. This is an exon, this is an exon, this is an intron. This, then it gets transcribed, DNA, RNA polymerase binds to the promoter with the help of general transcription factors. It transcribes this gene, and this is what you get. So the, the region between the promoter and the exon is called the five prime untranslated region or five prime UTR. That's basically between the promoter and the um, exon one. Between the exon one, yep. Oh. Are, what's the difference between a cat box and a tata box? Right. Like, are they both so, promoters? So, promoter is where RNA polymerase binds, right? Promoter is obviously part of DNA. So, it contains um, 
It's made up of base sequences, nucleotide sequences. Um, how do I explain this? There are certain sequences or there are certain base sequences which are found in most promoters. So cat box CAAT is a sequence which is found in most promoters. Tata box thymine adenine thymine adenine is a sequence found in most promoters. So these two are called consensus sequences. All right, they're just sequ base sequences found in most promoters. They're part of the promoter. And promoter is where RNA polymers would bind. Does so, that make sense? Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. But so like all uh, promoters have a cat box and a tata box, correct? Right. Okay, thank you. And so this is what, this is the problem I was trying to illustrate, right? So once RNA polymerase goes into the nucleus and it has like, you know, 20,000 different genes and each one has a promoter, how does it know which promoter to bind to? It uses transcription factors. General transcription factors bind to the promoter and specific transcription factors bind to enhancers, all right? So this is how they're basically telling RNA polymerase that, you know, you should go on to this promoter here instead of the 20,000 20, other promoters. Does that make sense? All right. Yes, thank you. All right. So this is pre-mRNA. It basically is a transcript of this region of DNA. It contains the five prime UTR, intro, exon one, intron, and exon two. This is, how do I know this is eukaryotic? Because it contain, contains an intron. Uh, prokaryotic mRNA does not contain introns, and so it's automatically ready for trans translation. All right. Now, contrast this with the prokaryotic transcriptional unit. So, check this out here. You have the promoter, it has a Tata box. As we said, these are consensus sequences found in most promoters. Now, the first difference you should see between the eukaryotic mRNA and prokaryotic mRNA is this region here the five prime UTR. The five prime UTR of prokaryotic mRNA contains a sequence called the shine dalgarno sequence or the SD sequence. This serves as the ribosomal binding site. You have to know this, okay? This is very important. The five, there's, sequence, there's a sequence within the five prime untranslated region of prokaryotic or bacterial mRNA. That sequence is called the shine dalgarno sequence. That is where uh, ribosomes bind in order to start translation. All right. This is the coding region here. This contains no introns, as you can see here. All right. And this is the three prime UTR. So as you can see, the bacterial or the prokaryotic mRNA is automatically ready for translation. And this is what I've told you here. The five prime UTR of DNA is transcribed into a shine dalgarno sequence. This is where ribosomes will bind. Notice no introns or non-coding regions or no junk. And because there's no junk, the prokaryotic mRNA can be immediately translated. All right? So Another... basically, the, can I ask a question? So the, yeah, the, sure. uh, the UTR basically is like the promoter or uh, for the prokaryotic? Ribosome, it... yeah. yeah. Okay. That's it. It, you can think of it like that, yeah, sure. So it's like the promoter for the ribosome. All right, in prokaryotes, eukaryotes or human cells, they don't contain the shine dalgarno sequence. Yes, we have cat and tata. Yeah, we, we, no, so, all right. Cat and tata, can you repeat the last part you just said? Okay. So, uh, let me just answer your question first. Um, the promoter is on the DNA, all right? The promoter is where RNA polymerase will bind to make mRNA. mRNA contains the five prime UTR. The five prime UTR in prokaryotes contains shine dalgarno. That is where ribosomes will bind. We as eukaryotes contain something else. So promoters are found on DNA, all right? And shine dalgarno on mRNA. Um, can you repeat the last part you just said? Um, I sort of did. Do you want me to repeat it again or are we good? It's fine. Oh, if you want me to repeat, I could. Okay. Um, no, it's all right. all right. I got it. Thank you. All right. Can you? Okay, I will. All right. So if you look at this, this is the bacterial G DNA. It contains a promoter with a Tata box and a cat box. It contains a five prime UTR. It contains a coding region. Basically, the genes would 
contain information for proteins, and then it contains the three prime UTR. RNA polymerase will bind to this promoter with the help of what? Does anyone know? In prokaryotes, how does RNA polymerase bind to the promoter? With the help of what factor? General transcription factors. That's in eukaryotes. Is it Sigma factor. Yeah. Sigma factor. Right? So Shine Dalgarno is on mRNA. Promoter is on DNA. DNA is what will get transcribed. mRNA is what will get translated. All right? So sigma factor is what prokaryotic RNA polymerase requires to bind to this region here. And what does it require to fall off this DNA? Row factor. Anyone... Row factor, yeah. Row factor. The DNA only needs to have the termination signal. Right, exactly. Good. And so when it gets transcribed, it generates mRNA. The five prime UTR in the mRNA contains the shine Dalgarno sequence, which serves as the ribosomal binding site. All right. Now, I sort of told you that when we were discussing differences between mRNA and DNA, I told you that mRNA was only one gene long, right? But there's an exception. And the exception is something called a bacterial operon. And bacterial operons are basically gene clusters. The regions of DNA which contains which contain loads of genes, they get transcribed at once into one mRNA. All right. So the mRNA for a bacterial operon contains information for multiple genes. The fancy word for that is a polycystronic message. All right. So eukaryotic mRNA is transcribed from a single gene and encodes a single protein. Bacterial operons are gene clusters which are all transcribed into a single mRNA. So if you look at this photo here, this picture here, there's a promoter, RNA polymerase with the help of sigma factor, because it's prokaryotic, will bind to this promoter. It will transcribe this five prime UTR with a shine Dalgarno sequence, and this transcribe this gene one. Then it will transcribe all of this, another shine Dalgarno, gene two. Then another, this sequence, then another shine Dalgarno, and gene three. So all of these genes are, all of the information for all of these genes is contained within the same mRNA. That's why it's called polycystronic mRNA, right? Each gene um, is translated independently. So one ribosome will bind to this gene and translate it. Another will bind to this gene and translate it. Another will bind to gene three and translate it. So the mRNA is a single, contains three genes. It's a polycystronic message. The ribosomes, or they're trans these genes are translated independently. Does that make sense? I have a question. Yeah. Does the Shindel Garno act the same way as promoters, like for the lagging strands when they replicate? Um, I have to be honest with you. My knowledge of DNA replication is not perfect right now. So you'll have to sort of look at the lecture and ask sort of the tutor who taught you the lecture. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right, that's no problem. Um, yeah, so that's um, one lecture done. So if I had to summarize this lecture, you should know that DNA is transcribed into mRNA. DNA contains genes. Genes have promoters. Promoters are bound by RNA polymerases. In eukaryotes, RNA polymerase is helped by transcription factors. In prokaryotes, RNA polymerase is helped by sigma factor. For termination, then the gene is transcribed. Then RNA polymerase has to fall off. In prokaryotes, it requires rho factor. In eukaryotes, it just requires a termination signal. That mRNA in eukaryotes is not ready to go out into the cytoplasm to get translated. So it has to undergo certain modifications. In contrast, prokaryotic mRNA is always ready as soon as it's transcribed to be translated. So it binds ribosomes, which bind to the shine Dalgarno sequence within the five prime UTR of that mRNA. Then that gene will get translated. An exception to the rule um, of mRNA only containing information from one gene is called a polycystronic message, which is seen in bacterial operons. These are basically gene clusters and these are transcribed at the same time into one giant mRNA. 
but each mRNA in but each gene is translated independently. They're transcribed at once, but they're translated independently. So that's one lecture done. All right. Where are bacterial operons present? They're basically DNA sequences. All right. So in second year, you study a bacteria called E. coli, which causes diarrhea and urinary tract infections. It has certain, op these are basically sequences of DNA, regions of DNA. All right, where many, many genes are present. So now, now we've discussed in, now all we're gonna discuss is eukaryotes, okay? All right, now we're gonna discuss eukaryotes because eukaryotic mRNA or pre-mRNA or HNRNA is not ready to go out into the cytoplasm to get translated. So it has to undergo certain modifications. The next lecture will basically look at those modifications, all right? Now, I'll sort of summarize all the modifications first, and then we'll look at each one in a bit more detail. So there's four modifications you need to know. And the term you use for all of these four modifications is called RNA processing, which generates R. So RNA processing is the process by which pre-mRNA is made into mature mRNA, which is ready to go into the cytoplasm and get translated, all right? And this involves four things. Number one, it involves capping. Number two, it involves polyadenylation. Number three, it involves splicing, which is removal of introns. We looked at this. And number four, it involves RNA editing. So these are the four processes which encompass RNA processing, all right? So let's look at each one now. This is what you saw in the previous lecture. This is the same you know, gene. This is the same mRNA. It contains a five prime UTR. It contains an exon one, an intron in the middle, an exon two, and a three prime UTR. So now, the first thing which will happen to this pre-mRNA or HNRNA is capping. So a seven methyl guanosine cap will be added to the five prime end of this mRNA. This will help the mRNA stabilize because mRNA are inherently unstable. They can be degraded very quickly. So by adding this five prime cap, you can stabilize that mRNA. Also, in eukaryotes, the ribosomes bind to this five methyl guanosine cap, right? So in prokaryotes, ribosomes bind to the Scheindahl garno sequence. In eukaryotes, they bind to the seven methyl guanosine cap at the five prime end. Does this make sense? Yes. Can you repeat this, please? Sure. So mRNA or pre-mRNA is inherently unstable. All right. So what you do to stabilize it is you add a seven methyl guanosine cap to the five prime end of this mRNA. That will stabilize this mRNA, but also it serves and as the ribosome binding site. It's similar to the Shine Dalgarno sequence in prokaryotes. So prokaryotes in the five prime UTR that was shine Dalgarno sequence. We ourselves have a seven methyl guanosine, our mRNA has a seven methyl guanosine cap at the five prime end, which serves as the ribosome binding site. So this is what we were discussing here. Ribosomal binding site in prokaryotic mRNA is the shine Dalgarno sequence. So that's the first thing. The second thing is polyadenylation. Polyadenylation involves at the three prime end. Okay, it begins at the three prime end. And basically, you add loads of adenine to the three prime end. So the first step was capping at the five prime end. The next step is polyadenylation or adding loads of adenines at the three prime end. This has two functions. It also stabilizes the mRNA, plus it helps the mRNA get out into the cytoplasm because you know that our mRNA is transcribed in the nucleus. It has to find a way to get out into the cytoplasm. Polyadenylation helps that process. Does this make sense? Or should I repeat this as well? Can you please repeat um, polyadenylation? Sure. So you have mRNA here. You've already capped it at the five prime end here. At the three prime end, you will add a signal called AAAAA, basically loads of, um, loads of adenines. This serves two functions. First, it stabilizes the mRNA. 
because as we said, mRNA is inherently unstable. It can be degraded very quickly. So that's the first function. The second function is that polyadenylation helps mRNA get out into the cytoplasm. So it aids in mRNA transport to the cytoplasm. So capping has two functions. Polyadenylation has two functions. Capping stabilizes plus serves at the ribosome binding site, similar to the shine dalgarno in prokaryotes. Polyadenylation also serves two functions. It stabilizes the mRNA also, and it helps the mRNA go out into the cytoplasm. Can I right. ask you a small question? Sure. Um, don't we uh, sometimes have something called nucleosome, which cuts the A, A, U, A, A, A protein yeah. so that we can so, add so, the uh, poly yeah, exactly. So I've basically sort of summarized all of this because I want to sort of focus this lecture on what's important for you guys to know. All right. So at the three prime end, what our friend is saying is that there's an enzyme. Basically, you see this region here. This region is not present in this diagram, is it? That's because there was an endonuclease enzyme which cleaved this region. This generates a signal called AAUAAA. This is basically a signal that here is where you should polyadenylate. This is where the A gets added, basically. All right. So there is an endonuclease which cleaves this region in the three prime UTR and allows for the addition of a poly A tail. This is just details, in my opinion. What you should know is that capping happens at the five prime end, polyadenylation happens at the three prime end. Capping has two functions, polyadenylation has two functions. Other than that, sort of um, whatever else you learn is, in my opinion, extra or is unlikely to sort of show up in your exam. All right. Now, so now we've dealt with sort of the ends of the mRNA. The last step we'll go through is removing this intron here. So what happens is that there's a a protein called a spliceosome. And you remember we discussed SNRNA, which is small nuclear RNA. It basically complexes to a protein and that entire complex is called a spliceosome. This spliceosome can excise or remove this intron and basically join these two exons together. And that generates this sort of whole exon or coding region. So this is the final mRNA here, all right? So you, this is what you had when you transcribed it originally. It was immature, it was unstable, it wasn't ready to be translated. You added a cap, you polyadenylated, and you spliced the intron out, and you joined the two exons together. Now this is mature mRNA. It's ready to go out into the cytoplasm. All right? So here's what I've told you here. Splicing is by spliceosomes, which are um, the abbreviation for spliceosome is SNRNP small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. They're made up of SNRNA and proteins, all right? RNA plus protein hybrids. This spliceosome basically removes introns, which are non-coding regions, i.e. junk, and adjacent exons are then joined together. Remember that prokaryotic mRNA doesn't have introns. So as soon as it gets translated, it will, as soon as it gets transcribed, it will also get translated, all right? So this was a summary of RNA processor. Does anyone have any questions? Nope. We good? All right. Now, this is what I would say is the most high yield or important concept in both of the lectures, which is the concept of alternative splicing. splicing. All right. So this is a gene, or this is an mRNA, basically, with four exons and three introns in the middle. Now, notice what happens here. Alternative splicing, so the spliceosomes will come in. They'll remove this intron, intron one. They'll remove intron two. They'll remove intron three. Then they'll join intron one, two, and four together to form the final mRNA. But alternatively, what can happen is that they can join intron one. Eh, sorry, they can join intron exon one exon three and exon four. So you have exon one, two, four here. You have exon one, three, and four here. So by the same pre-mRNA, you are generating a different final mRNA. Does that make sense? So this is the concept of alternative splicing. 
it allows you to, um, yes, okay, good. So in summary, alternative splicing is removal of introns and then the exons are joined in different sequences. And this allows you to make different mRNA transcripts from the same precursor. Oh, that makes sense. All right. So an example of this is antibodies. So you guys really haven't taken immunology yet, but what you should know is that um, we have cells, immune cells called B cells. These B cells produce antibodies, but on, and they produce antibodies when they sort of recognize that there's an infection. But when there's not an infection, these B cells express antibodies on their surface. So on their cell membrane, they have antibodies. On an, when B cells recognize an, an infection, they basically secrete antibodies. The mRNA that they use for the membrane bound antibodies plus the secreted antibodies is the same. But what happens is that through alternative splicing, that part or that exon, which codes for the part of the antibody which hooks onto the membrane, that part is spliced out or that part is removed. So the final product you get is not able to hook onto the membrane, hence that antibody is secreted. Okay, so we have a question. Um, normal splicing just removes introns and exons arranged in sequence. It's random. Yeah, exactly. So that's the concept of alternative splicing. All right. Or um, can you please repeat the last part? Sure. You mean the part about the antibodies? Sure. All right. So B cells contain antibodies. When you're not infected with a bacteria or a virus, these B cells express antibodies on their membrane. I think I can draw it for you guys. Um, yeah, so imagine this is a B cell, right? And it has antibodies on its surface, like this, all right? When you get infected, basically these antibodies get secreted. This is what an antibody looks like, all right? So what happened here is that the these are obviously different proteins because one is able to hook onto the membrane and one is not, and one is secreted. So they're obviously different proteins, but the mRNA that uh, synthesized both of them is the same. But what happened here is that this part, which is responsible for hooking these antibodies onto the membrane, that got removed by alternative splicing. And so these antibodies are now secreted, all right? So the, by alternative splicing, you're able to generate two sets of antibodies from the same mRNA precursor for this, from the same HNRNA. So that's the concept of alternative splicing. Does that make sense? Um, I don't understand which part is um, the different type of uh, mRNA. Right. Okay, sure. Um, so you see this part here? here? Yeah. This one. This part is what's hooking that antibody onto the membrane, right? Mm -hmm. um, now in these antibodies, these are secreted. These are outside. The cell secretes them. The cell, you know, it releases them into the bloodstream. And so yeah. these antibodies, they don't contain this region. Okay. So some of them stay on and some of them can unhook. Yeah, so when, when a B cell, you learn more of this in immunology, but when a B cell, is but when you haven't suffered an infection, B cells express antibodies on their surface. When you do suffer an infection and it's recognized by B cells, they start releasing antibodies. Can I ask right? you a question? The, this, okay. this, what you said is like, is it included to this in mall or it's just like an example? Because I don't recall the doctor teaching us this. So the doctor sort of told you about IgM versus IgD. There is a slide. Um, um, let me stop sharing and share you share with you another the doctor's presentation. So I think if uh, because I think he has an image I didn't include it in this presentation because I don't think it's that important for you guys to know. Um, okay. All right. 
I think he used the example of the alpha tropomyosin gene. I think. Yeah, that's another example. So this example here. Did you have this slide? Do you recognize I this guess slide? Yes. Yeah, I guess. Right. So IgM antibodies are what are the antibodies that are presented on the B cell membrane. IgD antibodies are secreted. So they're different antibodies. They have different functions. But the mRNA precursor, which they're synthesized from, is the same. However, basically, if you recognize here, you see this. This is the IgM antibody, which is hooked onto the membrane. You see this uh, terminal here, the C terminal, is quite long. This is the part which hooks onto the membrane, membrane-bound antibody. Now, notice this same sequence in the IgD antibody. It's, quite, it's very short, isn't it? And so this antibody is secreted. Does that make sense? And so this extra yes. part basically got spliced out. And so that's an advantage of alternative splicing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So this is an example of what you were talking about, the alpha tropomyosin gene. If you were, um, I don't know if you've taken sort of skeletal muscle contraction yet and smooth muscle contraction yet sort of actin myosin yes. interactions. Yeah, you have. So tropomyosin basically covers myosin, isn't it? And it inhibits actin myosin interactions. But when calcium binds to the actin, then myosin, tropomyosin sort of moves away. And now the actin binding sites are exposed on the myosin and the myosin actin can now link together, right? So tropomyosin is contained within striated muscle or skeletal muscle. It's contained within smooth muscle, it's contained within fibroblasts, and it's contained within the brain. However, each of them looks different, doesn't it? Their, their mRNA looks different. And that's because you sort of played with what exons you're joining together. That's another example. These are basically examples to help you um, understand why alternative splicing is significant from a molecular standpoint for your body. So these are very, very important functions of B cells. If B cells can't produce antibodies, and they can't secrete antibodies, you would be immunosuppressed and you would be susceptible to severe infections. But through alternative splicing, you're able to produce antibodies and secrete them, which help your body fight off infections. All right. So, um, yeah, so alternative splicing is what I would say is the major part of this lecture. You should know it. Now, but this can, but this can go wrong. So beta thalassemia is a disease where, have you studied structure of hemoglobin? Do you know what hemoglobin is? Yes. Um, right. So red blood cells carry oxygen to the whole body, and red blood cells are basically bags of hemoglobin. Thalassemia and hemoglobin is composed of four subunits, two alpha and two beta. All right. In beta thalassemia, you have abnormal production of the beta subunits. And so hemoglobin becomes abnormal, and the red blood cells are therefore not able to carry oxygen effectively. But so what they've noticed here is that in beta thalassemia, so this is the normal beta globin gene. All right, so hemoglobin is composed of four subunits, alpha and beta. This is the normal beta globin gene. It's composed of an exon here, an exon here, and a large exon here. The, the introns are in the middle, all right? But these are abnormal beta thalassemia globin chains. You see this region is a lot longer than this region. That means this region didn't get spliced out. So there was a mutation in the beta thalassemia gene, which allowed this region to stay on. And that resulted in the production of an abnormal beta globin, and which, which sort of made hemoglobin abnormal as well. Um, sure, I could send you my slides. So this is another example of an abnormal beta globin gene. Over here, you splice something which you weren't supposed to splice, basically. And you created four segments, right? So in a question, how he could sort of ask you about um, this in a in an MCQ would be he would um, so he would ask you for instance beta thalassemia he would tell you that beta thalassemia is an abnormality in hemoglobin and um, the beta globin chains in beta thalassemia are, are abnormal compared to the normal beta globin gene then he might ask you what might be 
the underlying mechanism by which these beta globin genes become abnormal? The answer would be alternative splicing. Does that make sense? Or alternatively, what he could do is he could ask you beta globin, he could tell you that beta globin genes are abnormal. Which of the following proteins is responsible for normal splicing? And you would say SNRNP or spliceosomes. All right. Or he could ask you, for instance, what is the RNA polymerase required for synthesis? of proteins responsible for alternative splicing. And you would say RNA polymerase 3, all right? Beta globin gene responsible for alternative splicing. The beta globin is a part of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is found in red blood cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen. And red blood cells require hemoglobin, normal hemoglobin to carry oxygen. In beta thalassemia, the beta globin part of hemoglobin is abnormal. One mechanism, for this abnormality might be defective alternative splicing. Does that make sense? All right, so this is another example. This picture you might not find in your slides. I took this from Google. I thought the picture in your slides wasn't really giving you a good idea of the butterfly rash you see in lupus. And so patients in lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, get this butterfly rash affecting both of their cheeks and the nose. Plus, they also have fever, they have a joint pain, um, and it's because of an autoimmune disease. And the problem in lupus is that there's a defect in cell death. And so what happens is your immune response, your immune system generates antibodies against cell components. So in lupus, you might see antibodies against DNA. You might see antibodies against histones. And an important sort of related to this lecture is that you can see antibodies to spliceosomes. And so that also tells you that alternative splicing is a target of an autoimmune disease, like lupus, for instance. So in lupus, uh, you see autoantibodies against spliceosomes. It's possible to see them. This is an example. This is called progeria. This is, called, this is hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome, um, an abnormality in aging, basically. What happens is, um, how do I explain this? Your nuclear membrane is composed of various proteins, all right? One of those proteins is called lamin A, all right? A defect in the alternative splicing of lamin A will produce an, ab as, um, an abnormal lamin A, which affects the morphology or, or the structure of the nucleus. If the nucleus, the nuclear, the structure of the nucleus is abnormal, the DNA repair and organization will become abnormal. If DNA repair becomes abnormal, you have more chances of mutations. And so this is the problem with progeria, all right? So we've covered three examples of alternative splicing. We've, just, we've covered beta thalassemia. We've covered lupus, in which you can have antibodies against SNRNP. And we've covered progeria, where there is defective lamin A because of abnormal alternative splicing. Do these three examples make sense? Yes, yes, okay. All right. all right, so that's good. So now we've covered three mechanisms. We've covered capping, 7-methylguanosine cap at 5' prime end, which has two functions. Can anyone remind me of the two functions of capping? Uh, it acts as a uh, ribosome uh, binding uh, site, yep. and it yep. also prevents the, it, it stabilizes the RNA. Good, and it happens at the 5' prime end. And yes. What um, serves as the ribosome binding site in prokaryotes? Um, UTR. Yeah, the in the in prokaryotic mRNA, what serves as the ribosomal binding site? The Shindalgarno. The Shindalgarno sequence, exactly, which is found in the five prime UTR. So all of this is happening at the five prime end. Uh, what about polyadenylation? What are, what are the functions of polyadenylation? It stabilizes mRNA and it helps mRNA get out of the cytoplasm or get out into the cytoplasm. Right, for translation. All right, good. And alternative splicing is mediated by spliceosomes or SNRNPs. Abnormalities are seen in beta thalassemia, in lupus, and progeria. All right, so now the last mechanism. So the other mechanisms we discussed, they're not really changing 
the nucleotide sequence, right? So if mRNA has a specific sequence of base pairs, right? It ha but for example, it would have adenine, guanine, um, uracil, uracil, adenine, guanine. So the mechanisms we've discussed so far, they don't really change that sequence. They just sort of help the mRNA stabilize, get out into the cytoplasm and become mature essentially. They don't really mess with the sequence of bases. This is where RNA editing is different. So RNA editing involves changes in nucleotide sequence of mRNA by insertion, deletion, or modification of bases. So that's how RNA editing differs from um, the other process that we've discussed, differs from capping, polyadenylation, and splicing. The three major modifications of RNA editing are citadine or cytosine. The base is cytosine. The, um, the base is citadine. The nucleotide itself is called cytosine, right? So now, citadine to uridine is another one modification you should be aware of, and it's catalyzed by an enzyme called citadine deaminase. Adenosine to inosine is another modification. It's catalyzed by adenosine deaminase, ADAR is the abbreviation. The third modification you should be aware of is guide RNA-mediated insertion or deletion of a uridine base. So guide RNA is a type of RNA which can bind to the mRNA, and it can either add or remove uracil, all right, or uridine nucleotides. So there's three modifications. So RNA editing, so just to summarize, RNA editing involves changes in nucleotide sequence of mRNA. There's three mechanisms. One is citadine to uridine by citadine deaminase. One is adenosine to inosine by adenosine deaminase. The other is guide RNA, which either inserts or removes uridine, all right? These modifications can affect splicing, and these modifications may also alter the ability of the mRNA to be translated. Because um, in a lecture called Regulation of Gene Expression, which you guys have in the midterm, that talks about something called microRNA. MicroRNA is basically a type of RNA which can bind to mRNA and inactivate it. So mRNA gets sort of processed. It goes out into the cytoplasm. Micro, if you don't want that mRNA to be transcribed, microRNA will come in bind to it and inactivate it, such so that the ribosome basically can't recognize it. These RNA editing mechanisms may have an effect on the ability of microRNA to bind. Transcribe or translated. Um, what did I say? To be translated. That's the, right. Did I say transcribe? Oh, sorry, my mistake. It should be translated, right? Um, yeah, so this is my mistake, sorry. And so RNA editing, in summary, affects splicing and it can affect the ability of the mRNA to be translated into a protein, all right? And there are three mechanisms. Um, now, this is one slide you sort of should be aware of. This is basically how guide RNA or gRNA causes RNA editing. Guide RNA, this is the guide RNA. It can bind to the RNA. It, firstly, it binds to mRNA, and then it can cleave a part of the mRNA to generate a nick, basically. It sort of creates a cut between the mRNA so it can edit in that space, all right? This is caused by an endonuclease enzyme. Then it can either add bases or remove bases. And what base would it add? It would add uridine. The enzyme which adds bases is called TUTAs, or terminal uridyl, uridyl transferases, and or it could remove uridine by an enzyme called exo-UAs, all right? So binding number one, number two, creating a, a cut between the mRNA by an exo endonuclease. Number three is addition or removal of uridine. Addition would be TUTAs, uh, removal would be exo-UAs, and then it would then ligate the NIC. The cut that I created would join the strands back together, and the enzyme here is called ligase, all right? Now, now why is RNA editing important? In GI, you will study, obviously you're in MSK right now, but in GI, you, you will study that when you absorb fats, you absorb fats in sort of proteins called chylomicrons, all right? Basically, fats are water insoluble, right? So they have to be bound to proteins in the blood. And so you surround these fats with proteins one of those proteins for, there's, it's more complex than this, but for now, this is enough. 
One of those proteins is called ApoB48. That's found in the intestine. So when you absorb fats in the intestine, that gets surrounded by a protein called ApoB48. All right, it, it's a lipoprotein which contains ApoB48. Now, in the liver, is the same mRNA, but you synthesize ApoB100. So this has 4,563 amino acids. This has 2,152 amino acids. It's the same mRNA. So how come, if it's the same mRNA, how come you're generating a different protein in the intestine compared with the liver? So that's the question, right? So it's the same mRNA, but in the intestine, you're generating a different protein. In the liver, you're generating a different protein. The mechanism behind this is RNA editing. So in the intestine, you have RNA, mRNA. You can edit, you can cause citadine deamination. So citadine deaminase will come in and convert the cytosine to a uridine. All right. This codon here is now a stop codon. So MR, the translation will stop at this codon now. So you have a truncated or a shortened version of that protein. That is called ApoB48. In the liver, you synthesize that entire protein, and so it's called ApoB100, all right? Here on the left-hand side, I've just shown you an image just to show you the differences between cytosine and uridine. So here's the nucleotide, here's the ribose sugar, here's where you'll have a phosphate group, and here's the, so sorry, so here's basically the base, right? And you notice here that cytidine has an amino group here, uridine has a carboxyl group here. So by citidine deaminase, it basically removes an amino group. That's why it's called deaminase. It removes this amino group to form uridine. This happens in the intestine to form a stop codon, which basically causes translation to stop prematurely. This, this creates a shortened version of that protein. That shortened version is called ApoB48. In the liver, this doesn't happen. And so you translate the entire protein and that whole protein is now called ApoB100, and it's a much longer form of the protein. All right. Does this make sense? It's quite complex. Um, you guys will understand this better in the future, inshallah. But does this make sense? RNA editing? Yes? Yes, okay. Does anyone want me to um, repeat anything or... All right. For me, I think if they were to ask you a question on RNA editing, they would just give you, they would explain this to you first in a question. They would say that ApoB48 and ApoB100 have the same mRNA. How come the protein in the intestine is shorter? And you should know that the mechanism is RNA editing. They would ask you more than that. All right. So just know that RNA editing is responsible for this observation, basically. So now we're done with the lecture. Um, just as a summary, transcription is mediated by RNA polymerase and generates mRNA. Bacterial mRNA is mature and translated, where, and translated immediately, whereas eukaryotic mRNA requires modification and translocation into the cytoplasm. M so this process of M this step of mRNA processing involves capping at the five prime end, which stabilizes and serves as the ribosome binding site. It and also includes polyadenylation at the three prime end, which stabilizes mRNA and helps mRNA move out into the cytoplasm. The third step of mRNA processing is called splicing. This can be, or, or, and this can generate through alternative splicing many different forms of mRNA from the same precursor. But this can go wrong in three diseases: beta thalassemia, SLE, and progeria. The last mechanism is RNA editing. RNA editing is, is in, basically involves changes to the nucleotide sequence of mRNA. It involves three mechanisms, C to U substitution or citidine to uridine via citidine deaminase, adenosine to inosine via adenosine deaminase. Number three is guide RNA mediated removal or addition of uridine. All right. And RNA editing is responsible for ApoB48 production in the intestine, but whereas the entire protein ApoB100 is synthesized in the liver from the same mRNA transcript. All right, so we're done with the lecture. I have some questions sort of beyond this. Do you wanna do the questions or?
Are you guys up for doing the questions? Yes. Or do you want to end the lecture? Okay, let's do the questions. So who wants to read this question? All right, I'll do it. Okay. So what do you guys think the answer is? Wait, give us a second to read. All right. <laughs> Is it F? Is it B? Someone says B, someone says F. All right. So what is the function of RNA polymerase 1? Produce odd RNA? Yeah. So ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is found where? Where is ribosomal RNA found? Golgi apparatus. Um, okay, so ribosomes are found sort of in the cytoplasm, in the endoplasmic reticulum, but their mRNA, their sort of, sort of, sorry, their RNA is synthesized in the nucleolus. So the nucleolus, that dark bit you see in the nucleus is called the nucleolus. That contains ribosomal RNA. So the answer would be B, all right? So for this question, you need to know two things. Firstly, what is the activity of RNA polymerase 1, which is synthesis of ribosomal RNA? And where is ribosomal RNA found? It is found in the nucleolus. All right. Does this question make sense to everyone? Yeah. So there's another question here. My tip for you would be not to focus too much on these values here. They don't mean much, all right? It's F. Is it F? Right, exactly. So all you need to basically answer this question, all you need is, all you need to answer this question is basically this part. So genetic analysis shows a mutation in intron 1, a processes involving which form or which of the following components is most likely affected in this patient. So small ribonucleoprotein. So now, if you look here, he has anemia, basically. Uh, low hemoglobin is basically low red blood cell, and that's anemia. So this patient has thalassemia, essentially, all right? So this is a case of thalassemia with a mutation in this intron which caused abnormal alternative splicing. So this should help you remember that beta thalassemia is one of the diseases where alternative splicing can be abnormal. What are the other two diseases? Uh, the one that has the butterfly rash. Yeah, the one, which one has the butterfly erythro. rash? SLE. SLE, yeah. And what the other one? What's the other one? Lupus. Uh, yeah, so lupus no. is SLE, right? Progeria, progeria. Oh, yeah, progeria. Oh, progeria. Yeah. So progeria is an abnormality in the nuclear membrane protein lamin A, all right? And that basically causes bad or abnormal nuclear morphology with defective or abnormal DNA damage with mutations, etc. So that's one question. Uh, wait, I have a question for the yeah. uh, for the previous question. How do you know it's beta thalassemia? Um, because of sort of um, you will learn that in third year. I'm uh, I'm afraid, so I have to wait for this. Okay, okay, all right, thank all right. you. So these lab values mean something, but these lab values help you figure out is thalassemia essentially. But for you guys, um. 
this was enough to you know solve the question. All right. Um, oh wait, yeah. I actually I don't really understand the this question. Yeah, I I don't know how you could tell from, like, how do you can you explain it to me again, please? Sure. Um. So this basically. Um. All right. So genetic analysis shows a point mutation in intron one of a gene on the short arm of chromosome eleven. So there was an intron which you introns usually get removed right during RNA processing, by which process splicing. So anything which affects introns and causes abnormalities, it has to cause abnormalities in splicing. You know, oh, otherwise okay. introns would just get removed. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, got it. Thank you. All right. So what um, other options include transfer RNA? I told you transfer RNA basically carries amino acids to the ribosome, so that has nothing to do with this abnormality. MicroRNA, I told you that microRNAs are a form, uh, are what microRNAs are is they basically bind to mRNAs and prevent them from being translated. And so this is a form of regulation. And so when I think Ibrahim al balqi is giving you guys a lecture on regulation of gene expression, so he should tell you about microRNAs, all right? What is C? What is C talking about? Promoter. Promoter, exactly. And so the Tata box is essentially a consensus sequence found in most promoters. The other is a cat box. Heat shock proteins, um, forget about them. H1 histone proteins, as you know, histones are basically proteins which form an octamer and DNA is wrapped around them. And this complex is called a nucleosome. So mutation in histones wouldn't really do anything. Small ribonucleoproteins are obviously the correct answer here. Um, which RNA polymerase synthesizes uh, small nuclear RNA? Which RNA polymerase synthesizes snRNA? Second. Second synthesizes mRNA and it synthesizes some so snRNA. So you're right, but usually people say the third. Second or third, I, I would accept both, all right? Isn't the third, uh, doesn't the third the synthesize? tRNA? It synthesizes tRNA. So second and third both synthesizes some snRNA, which I can, if you sort of go back to the here, no. Where is it? Yeah, you see it? So RNA polymerase 2 synthesizes mRNA plus some snRNA. It should be snRNA. RNA polymerase 3 synthesizes tRNA plus some snRNA, all right? Um, the first question, yeah, so over here, they were basically asking you what RNA polymerase one synthesizes. The answer was ribosomal RNA. The then the next thing you needed to know was where is ribosomal RNA found? Ribosomal RNA is found in the nucleolus. So the answer is B. For here, the answer was F because this guy had beta thalassemia. Um, this is another question. An investigator studying gene expression, she basically inactivates SNRNPs. All right. Which of the following processes is most likely to be affected? This is quite an easy question, I think. G. Yeah. Folding of proteins. What? Removal of introns. Yeah. So from your lecture on replication, what is F? Helicase. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, but I think we, this is the last question. Um, a group of investigators studying the effects of an abnormal protein. There are three isoforms of this protein from the same DNA segment. The, the what does one isoform, isoform mean? Isoform is, okay. Is it C? Yes, it's C, okay. Yeah. Isoform basically means Okay, so imagine you have a protein like, um, um, there's a protein in skeletal muscles called creatine kinase, all right? That protein is also present in the heart, it's also present in the brain, it's also present in other tissues. But okay, so it's the same protein, but has different functions depending on the location. It's the same protein, has the same function, the sequence is a bit different. Okay, so location okay. specific. 
Okay, so okay. for instance, when your heart is damaged, let's say you have someone has a heart attack, when the cardiac cells die, they release their contents, right? So you can measure that creatine kinase specific for the heart. And that would tell you that the heart cells have died, basically. And the same thing applies for the muscle. So the muscle isoform would be elevated if there's muscle damage or skeletal muscle damage. If you have a heart attack and your heart cells are dying, that would tell you that, um, that you would measure that by creatine kinase, all right? So that's specifically is isoforms, essentially. Uh, so what about this question? You, you guys said see everyone's figured it out? Okay, I got it, but I didn't get it at the same time. Okay. What I understood is that we have the same DNA. It gives us 1,186 and gives us 419 and 223, okay? And it's asking what causes this, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a question? Yeah. Okay, yeah, then I get it. Yeah, thank you. Yes, exactly. yes, thank you. Right. So what is A? Does anyone know this? What is A talking about? Is that editing? Have you ever heard of a term called epigenetics? Yes. And doesn't so, methylation like yes. stop a certain and regulation? Yeah, so let me expressed? just explain it to you. Um, if you sort of think about it, so each cell in your body, whether it be cells in the brain, cells in the muscle, cells in the heart, cells in the liver, they all have the same genome, right? They all have the same DNA. But the proteins a liver synthesizes is very different from the proteins the brain synthesizes. And the, what the proteins the brain synthesizes is very different from the proteins that the heart synthesizes, right? So depending on where you are in the body, gene expression is different, all right? So that should tell you that gene expression is very tightly regulated. So in, for instance, if you have a gene here and you have the promoter here, that promoter contains a, a cytosine nucleotide, basically. If you add a methyl group on it, a CH3 group on it, that will prevent RNA polymerase from recognizing this promoter. That will suppress gene expression, okay? So why am I telling you this? Because for instance, there's a protein which the brain synthesizes, which is important for the brain, but it's not important for the liver. So in the liver, that gene will be methylated. So this is how epigenetics plays a role in regulation of gene expression. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, I have a uh, question. Mm -hmm. Is hypermethylation also used for like, um? to suppress like cancer cells, like to yeah, stop them yeah. from replicating? Yeah, exactly. So um, actually I was gonna mention it, but like um, I thought you guys wouldn't be interested. Okay, but so in research, what you can do, so what is the problem with a cancer cell? What is the main problem with a cancer cell? Is that it's dividing too quickly, right? It will it's dividing too quickly. So. What are the mechanisms by how, how behind why that cancer is dividing quickly? It could be that a gene or a protein which regulates the cell cycle, which regulates cell division, is methylated and suppressed. Does that make sense? So cancer cells yes. might methylate a suppressor and this might allow them to proliferate very, very quickly. So what you can do is so what they usually do in a lab, for instance, it, they will, it's it, that they will grow a, a batch of cells, a normal liver cell, for example, and then they'll grow the same, and then they'll grow a liver cancer cell. And then they'll compare which genes are methylated and which genes aren't methylated. This will help them figure, this will help researchers basically figure out the mechanisms behind why cancer cells are dividing quickly or why cancer cells are sort of spreading out through the body. Does that make sense? And yeah sort of from a drug design standpoint, this is important because there are drugs called DNMT inhibitors. They can basically, if cancer cells have methylated and suppressed a gene, these drugs can basically unmethylate that gene. And they can sort of normalize the gene expression of the cancer cell. And so this is an anti-cancer strategy, right? So it's quite interesting. Um, sort of by in keeping with the lecture here, 
what is this talking about? Uh, it gives us the same, uh, the same sequence gives us more than one gene or more than one uh, protein. Okay, I'm gonna write it and you guys should get it basically. Does anyone know now? Operon. Yeah. So operon are found, operons are found in prokaryotic uh, DNA. They're basically clusters of genes and those genes are transcribed at the same time. And so the mRNA contains information for a lot of genes. It's not only one gene long like in humans. mRNA from bacteria, for instance, can encode or carry the information for multiple genes. Um, this, for instance, this here, right? So here. So this is a gene, this is a gene, this is a gene. RNA polymerase synth and the, all of these genes have the same promoter. So RNA polymerase binds with the help of sigma factor, synthesizes the entire mRNA for each gene. Each gene has its own shine dalgarno sequence. And each, uh, different ribosomes bind here, one binds here, one binds here. So each gene is translated independently. Um, other than, all right, that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. That was amazing. That was, that was Thank, so you so much. Thank you. No problem. No Thank problem. You. you want my slides, by the way? 